my talk is going to primarily focus at the end user. I'm really not interested in talking at the system level for system people because if you're a systems guy, you should probably already know most of what I'm going to say. Um, you've probably already done the research and there's a difference in levels. What, what is good for <coughs> enterprise server systems may not be good for home use and stuff like that. And I'll give some history and stuff like that. I just want to talk about some terminology. Um, first is RAID, R-A-I-D, is redundant array of independent disks. That's the current name for it. It's changed. Uh, range is used to incorporate uh, stripe sets, which I'll talk about, and to add redundancy. In general, RAID 0 is stripe, and a stripe is really where the file system spans multiple volumes. So a stripe can be from multiple partitions or multiple volumes. And RAID 1 is simple mirroring. One volume and another volume are just a mirror of each other. Uh, there is RAID 5, there's RAID 6, RAID 10, which is, that, I'm not going to talk about that in detail. Stripe, I just said with Stripe, data is spanned on multiple volumes or devices. And I just spoke about mirroring. LVM is Logical Volume Manager. That's very popular in Linux, primarily on uh, uh, Red Hat systems and Fedora. It's a Logical Volume Manager. It's been around for a long time. Uh, was used uh, very heavily at uh, Hewlett Packard on uh, HPUX. And uh, recent versions of LVM actually incorporate RAID or RAID aware, which is, which is good. Journaling is another important thing. Jur in, for older Linux users or Unix users, when you had a crash or a failure or power failure or something like that, to recover your system, you used to have to do a file system check or FS check, and it would take a long time. To recover. Journaling is allows the file system to store in metadata enough data so that when you do the FS check it can recover this data rather than have to do the complete file system check. And rather than so it knows when stuff has been written properly to disk. And of course, Windows users remember check disk and orphan files and stuff like that, which used to really plague Windows. Uh, NTFS, by the way, on Windows is a journaling file system. And virtually all of the recent Linux file systems are journaling. Okay, the file systems are going to talk about primarily ext2. EXT2 has been around for a long time. It's called the Second Extended File Systems, and it was the standard for several years. EXT3 was a slight improvement over EXT3. It basically was EXT2 with journaling added. It also was backward compatible. So you could take an existing EXT2 file system tell it it's an ext3 file system <coughs> and it would automatically start journaling. It wasn't quite that automatic, but it would work that way. ext4 was essentially written primarily by Ted So, and Ted is a local guy here in Boston who has been mating the ext3 file systems for, for a while. Um, and ext4 is 
has a lot of improvements over the EXT3. It's still backwards compatible, so that you can actually mount the EXT3 file system, and it will kind of become an EXT4. Now the new one, now the other ones. Uh, BTRFS is B-Tree File System, or ButterFS as it's called. This is the, what I call the file system of the future for native Linux. Um, I'll talk about it in more detail a little bit later. Um, it is currently being used by OpenSUSE as its default file system. Uh, it will be used by Fedora 23, not by Fedora 21. When I, <coughs> I'm not home. Okay. Um, XFS, I got an apology, I forgot to make the specific slides for XFS. But XFS was essentially a journaling file system that was developed by uh, Silicon Graphics or SGI. It has been selected as the default file system for use on Red Hat Enterprise 7. Prior versions of Red Hat Enterprise were using either EXT4 or EXT3. JFS, I haven't seen that around lately. JFS is IBM's journaling file system. Uh, we, when we had an EX, when we had a uh, AIX speaker here a few years ago, he absolutely said that none of the IBM code has been ported to Linux. And one of our members really challenged him on it. And it was a pretty heated discussion. I don't um, think we had the right guy. What? I don't think we had the right guy. Yeah. But IBM has yeah. two versions of JFS. Yes. This is. JFS is not really the AIX file system, it's more the OS2 file system. Um, we invited him to give a talk on how AIX is different from other types of Unix. And he basically gave a talk on why Unix is better than Windows. Which was, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. yeah, you had the wrong guy. Yeah. Well, he didn't know much. That was like I said, you had the wrong guy. <laughs> okay. Riser FS, I'm including Riser FS because for historical purposes. Riser FS was essentially headed up by Hans Riser, who in jail is yep. serving time for killing his wife. I don't remember what prison he's in. It's out in California. But the file system, I think, has some relevance to us today. Okay. Now, why you should be interested? You're just, an end, you're just an end user, and you want to turn on your computer and you want it to work. So why should the file system be of any interest to you? Well, you keep a lot of personal data, so you want a file system that is going to keep track of your files. Your files are not going to hide on you or go away. And you want to see, it, see that they're reasonably secure. Um, so the file system is what actually reads and writes your data. And the file system is a set of standards under which the drivers have to operate. And you want to make sure that when you save a file, it's there in the future so that the integrity is not compromised. I sometimes like to talk about Linux versus Windows. Not that Linux is better than Windows, like we just mentioned, but the Linux file systems are very different from the Windows file system. In Linux and Unix, all Linux file systems are derived from Unix, the UFS, the Unix file system. And when you read or write from a file or to a file, the operating system maintains a set of buffers that you're reading and writing into. And the operating system, at some point in future, flushes those buffers to disk. 
Uh, they also a certain amount of persistence, so you can actually write a file and have and then delete that file, and that file could never even actually be written to disk. Uh, you'll see where ButterFS has a little bit of support for that. Uh, but that is also a little bit true for other file systems. What in Windows, every time you write to a file, the file or the block is written to disk. So the operating system does not inherently buffer that to you. Now there are some things like in C language, if you use file AO, uh, use file, um, library functions, there's a little bit of buffer in that, and of course, uh, your disks can actually have cache firmware in them, so it caches. But in generally, Windows is going to, when you, the program says to write a block, it's going to be written almost immediately. And so it's a little bit slower than uh, Linux. And this advantage gives Linux a little bit of a performance advantage in uh, files. And the other thing in Linux and Unix, the file name is not an integral part of the file system. You can have a file that exists without a file name in Linux. And it does happen. Uh, you can have multiple hard links for a single file. So a single file can actually have two, two or more physical names, or it can have names in different directories. Um, a hard link is an integral part of the file system, and I talk about later, I talk about a use count, which is actually a link count, um, so that you can remove you can remove the file name, and that all that does is remove the file name and decrements the use count. Uh, example here that I have is an empty directory, actually has two names. In the parent, it has the name it's known under, and in the, in its itself, which is the child, its name is actually a dot. Period. That's a physical name. Also, if you make any subdirectories under it, then each one of those subdirectories will dot dot. That is correct. Um, now, I just want to mention a symbolic link is different to different from a hard link. A symbolic link is very similar to a shortcut in Windows. It's really a pointer to the file name. So, it, even though it's part of the file system, it's it's really a separate file that actually points to the file name. So a directory in Linux, when it has a file name in there, it actually points to the inode. And every file has as its root the inode. I talk about the inode a little bit later. Because it's an important concept that makes Linux and Unix unique. And I said deleting a file using the rm command may not physically remove the file. Because if the file is in use, it's not going to get deleted. I have an example coming up. Would it be on reboot? What? If you RM'd it, would it be removed on reboot? Or the... Not necessarily. Okay. <coughs> it depends. What happens is it's not actually removing the file itself. It's just removing the file. I explain this here. Okay. Only the operating system actually removes a physical file. It's actually the file system portion of the operating system. When you issue the remove command on a file, what it does is it bumps what I call the use count, or in the inode it's actually called the link count. Uh, but I didn't want to link, I didn't want to use that terminology. When the link count gets down to zero, the OS will physically remove the file. So you can have multiple instances of the same file. And one of the problems is, let's say, if you have a file that's being, that's opened by such Etsy slash, 
by an uh, and you try to remove that file to reclaim space, and you find I'm not getting any space back. And at that, you actually have to restart an init to do that. But you don't have to reboot the OS or remove it. And when a program opens a file, that count is in incremented by one. So here's an example. Let's say that you're going to do an update on a file called libc.so. This is the one of the main libraries that we use in Linux and Unix. And so when you're doing an update, when libc.so gets updated. If you do a yum update or an apt get update or whatever the uh, Debian name for it is, uh, it's going to automatic, it's going to download your libc.so or any other so, so really means shared object, and they're really libraries. And for Windows people, they're equivalent to DLLs, dynamic link libraries, or dynamic load libraries. So what happens is you don't want to physically remove it because you have a lot of programs running that might be actually using that library. So libc.so gets downloaded when you're doing an update. And if you look on disk, libc.so will actually point to an area on disk that contains the new version of libc.so. The old libc.so will still be on disk. It just won't have a file name. Um, but it'll still be in use. And since these are shared libraries, there are various uh, ways that libraries are shared in Linux by the OS. And so it, it might still be, you know, resident in memory, and you might have two libc.so's actually resident at the same time. Um, and you don't have to reboot. It's not advisable to download libc.so and not reboot, but there's really no real harm doing it. And so, as I said, the older version of libc.so does not physically get removed until all the programs that are actually using it exit. Then its count is going to go down to zero and OS is going to remove it. Or if you have to reboot your system, it will get removed. Since a file name in Windows is an integral part of the system, is when you download a file, it physically overwrites the existing. So let's say you've got a very important DLL. Let's call it libc.dll. Make that equivalent to the uh, one we've been talking about. If, you, if Windows tried to actually download let me just change terminology. If Windows actually tried to overwrite a DLL that's actually running, it's going to cause any program that's using that DLL to crash. So on Windows, when they install an update, they install them in a separate area that actually require you to reboot the system to make those files available. So, in general, in Linux, when you install an update, the only real thing that requires a reboot is an updated kernel. There are some others that you probably want to reboot. But if you, let's say, have an update that's giving you a new version of X Windows, you don't need to reboot, but you do want to log off and log on, which will cause the uh, file manager, the Windows uh, display manager, to be reloaded, and all the X libraries. So, so how does the file manager? You know, so basically, you're saying you write to the libc.so. It's in the same directory in user bar or whatever, and it 
keeps both the old version, it keeps track of who wants the old version, and then as soon as you exit, it will then replace that file. Yeah. I mean, what's going on under the hood here? Okay, under the hood, a directory, directory names are not integral part of the operating system. So, even, even though directories are supported by the operating system, when you can remove a file name, the old file can still be there on disk, and it will still have an inode. Inodes are very important because that's really where the, what the file name is. The file name is a number, which is the inode number. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a libc.so that has a name, and you're going to have a libc.so that's currently in use by other files. And they know it as a, it's already an open file. So they know it's already been loaded in memory when pro these programs load because it's shared. It's in shared uh, space for your program. So it has a use count of non-zero use count. So it's still a memory. Programs using it will still know where it's at. Um, and so, so does that version, the old version of libc.so, then only exist in RAM when the file system? Arrives? No, it actually exists in disk, but it does not have a file name pointing to it. Oh, it just has the inode. It just I has the inode, unless you've created a hard link to yeah, it. Or yeah, something. But, but under normal circumstances, then the the yes. new file name. Or the old file name then gets associated with a new inode such that anybody yes. that loads that file gets pointed to the new inode. That is correct. And does it clean out the old inode at some point? When the use count goes to zero, yeah. the file the file will be deleted and that space will be recovered. And when does that happen? When the use count, when the use count goes to zero. I see. No, it when if, use it. So if you have any programs okay. running that use that libc.so, which is very persistent, it'll still be there, but when those programs exit... And if you have a crash or the power goes out while the, the file has been updated, it's still pointing to... I mean, what happens then? then it'll get deleted. It. That's part of the file system check when the system gets started. So that's not a, it's, it's an orphan. Um, because your inodes, there's a lot of buffering in the kernel, and I don't want to get into a lot of details because each file system is different how they handle that. But there's a structure on disk, and there's a structure in memory. And the use count is more of a memory count. And the on disk count is more of a, um, a, more of a count of links, physical links. But it's different, and I don't want to get into detail yeah. because I can't give you a really good answer on that without doing some research. Um, I did at one time work with somebody that was writing a file system. Okay, the EXT family, the original file system Linux was actually the Minix file system. There used to be a system called Minix. And Linus actually took that file system, but he hated it. And I think that over the years there's been a lot of exchanges and email and stuff between Linus and Tannenbaum, who was the originator of Minix. But I don't want to get any history of that. And EXT was originally written by Remy Card in 1992. And it was loosely based on UFS, which is the standard Unix file system. At one time, there was only one Unix file system. It had two gigabytes file size maximum. And in 1993, Remy came up with EXT2, which replaced EXT. EXT2 essentially is the basic Linux file system and has been for quite a while, since 93. Okay, EXT3 emerged in 2001, but it's backwards compatible with EXT2. And I talk about each one of these individually anyway. 
The XT4 was made available by Tetso in uh, 2006. So, I got the venerable XT2. Essentially, the file size is dependent on the block size. Uh, a one kilobyte block size, which is essentially the standard block size that we know of in Linux, and that allows for a 16 gigabyte file size. By increasing the block size, you can actually have up to two terabytes. Uh, the problem there is a small file ends up taking up a lot of room because it's very sparse. It doesn't have much. You write a file that has one line of text in it. It's not going to take, it's only going to take up a fraction of a block. So you've got a real waste and that's uh, one of the issues with uh, things like EXT. Directories are not indexed, so that directory searches and stuff like that do for large directories can take a long time. Uh, file compression can be added to the file system. Files and directories are stored in the inodes. And the timestamps are 32 bits, which means they will go negative January 18th, 2038. Uh, I didn't do my math on that because I had thought it was in June, but I've run, in, I've, I've run into the 2038 bug before. In the financial industry, we plan things go out in 50 to 75 years in the future, especially doing simulations. So that was a limitation for quite a while. Uh, Don't use those on bond expiration dates. <laughs> absolutely positively true. When I was at Digital, um, one of the standards tests, I was working with uh, the, uh, oh, I was working with the system that actually keeps track of people that are logged in. I even forget what the name of it is now. <laughs> but um, the standards test for that actually was using some code that actually was based on time, and it failed. I walked in the I walked in the morning, and the I got really I got jumped. It's your standards test failed. We cannot release digital Unix version such and such because the standards failed. Um, I did some research and found that it was a bug in the standards test. Fortunately, there was an Irishman by the name of uh, Murphy. <laughs> uh, true, he's spoken here. Finbar Murphy, who is actually spoken at the BLU, and Finbar happened to know the developer of that code, and we were able to get a waiver. So our it could get out and he fixed the standards test. But the standards test was actually bitten by the 2038 bug. And yes, uh, bond expirations go out for a long time. <coughs> Almost every financial company has their own date routines. Including my company, which was Algorithmics. We had our own date stuff because we do uh, simulations going out way into the future. But even if you're not doing simulations, uh, pricing bond maturities. Yes. Well, that's what we do is we do them and stuff like that with the simulations. Yeah, and the pricing of them. And, and estimated retirement dates for new employees. Yes. Yeah, well, in 2000, you can all go home, right? <laughs> Anyway, 2038, you know, that, that's a problem, but it's a problem that uh, we in the Unix industry recognized quite a long time ago, long before year 2K, and uh, there was a big standards fight over whether to make the standard time in Unix 
64-bit. And Linux actually became, Linux standardized on 64-bit time. But uh, Unix didn't, and I had some stuff in there that I had to futz with so that stuff that I wrote didn't break. I, when I worked at Burger King back in the 1970s, I actually, in COBOL, wrote time routines and handled the year 2000. But anyway, that was a different thing. I didn't even know about Unix at that time. Well, at least operating system Unix. Okay, I have here a little chart that's on uh, inodes. And an inode consists of, and this is not total, but it generally consists of an inode number, uh, block count, file deletion time, file type, owner, access control list if you're using ACLs, timestamp, access, change, and modification time, there are three timestamps, file generation number, group, permissions, extended attribute, number of blocks, file size, number of links, which is the use count, and status flags. Um, I do provide a link in here to a discussion on the item because you could spend hours just talking about that to a technical thing. Okay, EXT3 was <coughs> written by Stephen Tweedy <coughs> and introduced in um, 1998 and was included in the 2415 kernel in 2001. <coughs> It's an in-place upgrade to EXT2. So essentially, an EXT3 file system was actually an EXT2 file system with mainly journaling, a couple of extra goodies added on to it. So if you took an EXT2 file system and actually mounted it as EXT3, it would actually become EXT3. But subsequently, if you wanted to mount it as EXT2, it would stay that way. Uh, EXT2, by the way, is still being used in smaller devices like um, memory sticks and things like that. Uh, the benefit is, again, is the journal. Is Today, you definitely want a journaling system. So if you lose power or something to your computer, you want to be able for it to come up quickly. If you did not have journaling, it could take hours for even a laptop to reboot because we're using a lot of large uh, disks. More than was available. Yes? So, I don't understand what exactly does journaling making it faster to like what, what does it add to it? Well, what journaling really is, I have a little bit of a discussion later, but what journaling really is, is a technique to where when files are written, some things are actually stored in metadata. So if the system crashes, it has enough information to start back up and to recover that data that may have been lost during the crash. Uh, if you have to do a complete file system check, you actually have to go through the entire file system block by block by block by block. So, the journaling is only for files that haven't been written to the file system yet? Excuse me? <coughs> Sorry, journaling only matters for files that haven't been written to the file system yet, so it just has to check this journal and that's enough to recover? Most of the time, yes. Okay unless the file system is really damaged. Um, and there are a number of techniques in uh, journaling which I'm not going to talk about, but I will mention in my next slide. Uh, NTFS, by the way, the NT file system for Windows, is a journaling file system also. <clears throat> and it really, not, <coughs> not having a journaling file system for a large disk uh, is not a good thing. Okay, and as I said, EXT3 adds journaling, and there are three, essentially three kinds of journaling that it does, adds. 
it has a journal, which is write back. There's order, which is the default, and there's write back of data, which is another thing. And I, I have a set of references at the end of this slide, and number 13 is a link to discussion on journaling if you want to follow it further. Because it is important, it's an important feature of all file systems going forward. Okay. EXT4 is a major upgrade of EXT2 and 3. As I mentioned, it was written by a local guy, uh, Tedso, who was a maintainer of EXT3. Uh, and uh, Ted's around. I bumped into Ted a few times. Um, and EXT4 essentially, Ted brought it into the kernel in uh, 2008. And Although I have not found the quote yet, I haven't looked very hard. Ted is now supporting ButterFS, not ext3. I mean four, even though he wrote it. But I have not seen that written down, and so I don't say it in my slide. Uh, and again, Google used ext4 for its storage systems in 2010. And ext4 is definitely a good, solid server operating system, uh, file system, as are all the ext's. A uh, lot of new features in ext4. I've got most of them here. Again, it volumes up to exabyte sizes. Um, File sizes up to 16 tebabytes. Uh, tebabyte, or hex, a tebabyte is really a terabyte, but based in power of two. <laughs> so these are real terms. Um, so in, one of the problems you deal with in computer science is that a, a lot of your terms are based on power of two. And bitmaps and things, everything is binary on a computer. <clears throat> so while a terabyte is based on a power of 10, a tebabyte is based essentially on a power of 2, mm -hmm. but it a ba is based on like 2048, 4096, etc. It, it's guaranteed not a mix-up of 10 yes, and exactly. twos. Okay, let's not... Now, Red Hat essentially recommends using XFS for volumes larger than 100 terabytes. And I say here TB is terabyte because the reference that I'm using says that. Okay. The system uses 48-bit addressing, which is considerably more than ext3 and 2. The timestamp date has a limitation of April 25th, 2514, and uh, it also supports online defragmentation. What, what's the point of 48 instead of just going to 64-bit addressing? Does it really help anything? <clears throat> I didn't research that, but if you look at a lot of chips, even though the 64-bit chips, the physical addresses, maximum physical address is 48 bits. I don't know why I have not looked at yes. The, I, the, when you design the inode, sometimes it's useful that you allocate that 64 like bytes per yeah. bits per block or something like that. Yeah. Right? They ha they have a, like squeeze uh, addresses actually that actually can fit into like certain blocks. That's yeah. usually it's, it's, it's coming from. Yeah. It's like a, a floating point address is actually 64 bits, but it's actually 65 normalized. But I don't want to get into that <laughs> uh, yeah. because I've been through that before. So I used to maintain the math library for Unix. Okay. And the inode is 256K, where ext3 is 128K. Persistent pre-allocation, which means 
extra space for a file can be pre-allocated, which, which is nice so that when you're writing to a file and you know that file is going to be expanded, you already have the space for it. You're not, you don't keep going out and ask for another block. And it uses an extent based, and I meant extend, not extent. Um, John, make a note of that and you can fix that or I'll fix that later. But it's an extent based storage, which is a little bit different from the previous. So the, the in, in memory structure is, a, is quite a bit different. And it's a and essentially, it's backward compatible for EXT2 or 3. Again, they can be mounted as EXT4, and they will become EXT4 file systems. Okay, performance features. Multi-block allocation where multiple blocks can be written at the same time. Uh, that is a big win because uh, if you can write a larger amount of data to the disk at one time, you, you can keep them, keep it from fragmenting, and uh, it'll actually write out faster because the disk spins around in circles. Uh, that may not be 100% true with SSD, but for those disks it is. Delayed allocation. This allows multiple block writes and reduce fragmentation and reduce processor time for files that are short term or temporary. And I spoke of that earlier. As I mentioned, Unix and Linux have internal buffers. So if you have a file that's very small, you create the file and write to it, it can stay in memory and never get to disk. I actually ran into that in Python when I have a temporary file, I put uh, SQLs, I'm putting SQL uh, commands in it, and of course, then I have to flush it to disk so that it can be used. But I can't close it, because if I close it, the temporary file is going to disappear. But Again, Linux has the capability of keeping very small files in memory without ever having to write them to disk. Um, and there are a lot of files that are kept around as temporary files. Uh, your compilers do it all the time. If you've ever worked with a C compiler and the number of little files it keeps around is tremendous. And they're all slash temp or slash user temp. These are driving me nuts sometimes. Because <laughs> uh, I used to work in a compiler group. And uh, EXT4 it remains default for the Fedora 21 and recent Debian systems. Um, ButterFS. This is the Linux file system of the future. And I'm going to get some arguments. Some people are arguing that ZFS is better. Some are arguing ButterFS is better. I don't want to get in this discussion. There are certain reasons why you might want to use ButterFS but, or ZFS. If I'm running a server or a, a NAS system, which Jabber does at home, I probably today use ZFS. Next year, I might use ButterFS. But right now, um, you want to use something that you know is stable for a server. But I think right now that ButterFS is almost is ready for prime time today. Okay. ButterFS is what's called a copy on write file system. And it's implemented in advanced features while fo focusing on fault tolerance, repair, and easy administration. It's jointly developed at multiple companies. ButterFS is licensed under GPL, 
which is important, I think. And it's open to contribution from anyone. And I, these square numbers that I have there, these are pointers to the references in the back of the slides. Okay. And ButterFS was originally developed by Chris Mason, who had experience working on the riser file system, which is one of the reasons why I think there's a lot of riser uh, technology that's in here. And Chris actually was working, I think he still works for Oracle. Not 100% sure. Um, currently, OpenSUSE 13.2 has ButterFS as the default file system. In Fedora 21, Fedora 20, you can select ButterFS. And I actually used ButterFS a couple of years ago, but I screwed something up and I striped it onto three disks. I only meant to stripe it onto two, so I went back to my RAID stuff. But uh, because I need to learn a little bit about ButterFS and ButterFS administration, which is a lot better today than it was two years ago. It will be the default in Fedora 23. That's already been announced. And a couple of things. It used an extent-based storage, similar to ext4. It's got a 16 exabyte maximum the file size of 2 to the 64 power. Uh, space, should, space efficient packing for small files, that's a big win. That was one of the big reasons, big wins that Riser file system had. Is in ext 2 when you have a small file system, you build it by block. So the minimum size of any file system in ext is 1K even a file system that has three words in it, in text. The minimum is 1K. In ButterFS, in RiserFS, you can have small, file system, efficient file systems. Correct me if I'm wrong on these. For your, for your curiosity, you know, uh, you know, the guy, Jason, was like the Chris Mason uh, left Oracle in 2012 and joined the Fusion IO. Then a year later, he left Fusion IO and joined Facebook. Okay. <laughs> That's good. So, yeah, I did not really research where Chris has been lately. It's, I wanted to get more accurate information in here. Um, Wait, so you said that in earlier slide, an inode in ext4, whatever, was, was it, two, it 256 kilobytes? Yeah. Wait, so the minimum, let's say I have three words in a file. That file will take up however many bytes on the file system, but then isn't it linked to an I know that's 256 kilobytes? I don't understand this. Probably. Yep. So that, that, I think that's the whole I know actually to, yep. to store the whole, the whole well, files actually in the, in the disk. If you do the math, yeah. you know, uh, like or if you were like 100 terabytes, whatever, yep. whatever the maximum size, and but then divide we, into the one, number of blocks, that should be the block addressing, right? That gives right. you uh, how the many inode, number of yeah. bits you need actually to per block. Right. right. The inode yeah. isn't. Yeah. The inode storage. The, the inode is not going to. But it really doesn't matter too much on that. But all all files actually go up to the inode structure. So. I'm not. I'm not sure. In Unix, the inode has been around since day one. And in the original inode was an array. In every file, the inode number was actually an index into the array. And that's what it was for years. And directories were, um, I think, 14 characters long, period. And that was it. You had 14 character directories, name, file names, and you could actually edit a directory, and the directory had the file name and then had the pointer, the inode number. And that was it. Each directory was 16 bytes long, the first two bytes were the inode number. Yeah. And then the 14 were the file name. Yep. So, 
It's been a long time, but in uh, directories, when long file names came in, directories changed. And really, while you can actually edit a directory with a text editor, it doesn't do you any good. Okay. Um, the other thing here, as I say, is space efficient index directories. The reason you want index directories is for very fast searching of a directory. Okay, so that's a performance improvement. Uh, dynamic inode allocation. So you really don't need you don't need a fixed storage for your inodes. So the inodes can grow and they can shrink. And another thing that I like about uh, ButterFS is it has writable and read-only snapshots. Um, whereas you can do snapshotting and uh, you can look that up. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it's a very, one of the most important features of both ZFS and uh, ButterFS. And you can have sub-volumes. Okay. Uh, ButterFS also has checksums on data and on metadata. It has file compression built in. It uh, uses, um, I forget the two, file compression. I didn't put it in here. I'm just going to talk about file compression. But file compression is actually built into the file system. And it's integrated multiple device support. It supports, directly supports striping, mirroring, striping plus mirroring, and striping with single and dual parry. Which I think in terms of a end user, I think most of what you're going to want as an end user is just either striping or just not worry about striping. You use just one volume. You can stripe it into multiple volumes if you want. Um, there is a bit of redundancy built in to the file system. Uh, so I think for my own case where I do backups, uh, I don't care about mirroring. Even at home right now, I've got two EXT4 file systems that are doing RAID 1 mirroring. I think for the most part, for home use, you're not going to need it. Okay, it has SSD awareness. I'm not going to talk more in detail on that, but it knows about uh, certain things about SSD. And I think more of those are going to be added to it. I think that's another difference. And it has an efficient incremental backup. Okay, conversion of EXT2 or 3, EXT3 or EXT4 file systems. Again, like EXT4, you can mount an EXT4 or an EXT3 system and convert from those EXT3 to EXT4. C devices are essentially template file systems, especially in a large shop if you want to make multiple file systems. You can. Makes it a little bit easier. Subvolume aware quota support. Most of us don't really care about quota. Send and receive subvolume efficient incremental file system mirroring and batch deduplication, which happens after writing. Uh, deduplication is essentially in compression where you have multiple pattern of multiple things with the same pattern. Like you have a song, Jingle Bells. That whole phrase, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Those are duplicated throughout the song. Well, in, a, in a compressing that, if you can deduplicate that pattern, you uh, save a lot of space. And if you play it, you can go all the way to the mental hospital. 
As far as I know, it's by default. It's part of. It's probably an option to some extent because you can change. You get as a default a um, compression, but you can actually change which compression algorithm you want to use. And I just, it, I don't know if deduplication is actually an option on that or not. So this is ButterFS you're talking about? Yes. And this means that the files that are stored on your drive, say, are all compressed files then by default? Yes. So some other system looking at it might not know what the hell you've got. Right? Yeah, that's some advantage. Or disadvantage. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but um, if they have ButterFS running, they'll certainly be able to. The other thing you didn't mention is that you can contract file systems with Butter, if I understand correctly, right? Yes. You can make it smaller. Like you can shrink a RAID, which is something you cannot do with ZFS, which I think is yes. big. That was a big sort of philosophical mm -hmm. debate. Okay. Now, Butter. So here's my observations right here. I think that ButterFS today is ready for prime time, but just barely. I think maybe six months ago, it probably wasn't quite ready. And I don't think it's ready for heavy production servers yet. Uh, I think within the next year, you might see it starting to migrate into production. Uh, but enterprise users essentially are going to Enterprise users really are, they want stability. Conservative. And they're very conservative. <clears throat> and they're not going to go to something new and shiny until it's been proven before. So it's got to provide a lot of benefits to them before they use it. OK? There are several other non-native file systems, XFS and ZFS, that are probably better for service use today. Uh, one of the members of this group, uh, Jabber will remain nameless, uh, has <laughs> built a NAS system last year and uses ext 3 or 4. No, use ZFS, I'm sorry. Don't you on your NAS? Yeah, well, I think it was more than a year ago. Yeah. But you built it using ZFS. No, I also built the NAS with ZFS. Yeah. Okay. Well, ZFS. It's not, it's not Linux, though. It's just for uh, free NAS. Yeah. Which is based on OpenBSD. Uh, yeah. FreeBSD. In any case, ZFS is certainly a good file system. I will talk a little bit more about it. Uh, ButterFS will become the file system over the next year or two. Again, it has better performance than a RAID 1 EXD four file system, and I will upgrade my home file system shortly. I just haven't done that yet. Maybe even my work files, my work system. My work workstation is running Fedora 20. I haven't upgraded yet. Okay, a couple of issues. And again, what I wanted to do was find, yes? Do you know or think that they will <coughs> include the support of BetterFS better in Debian? I did not understand what you're saying. Sorry, it's my accent. Um, no, it's okay. Do Do you know if they if the Debian team will plan for to add support someday soon, like the next Debian version? Or? With Debian, it will be the next century. Oh. <laughs> well, you could start it today. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> is there a reason for that? Like that, that they're, you're, you're saying that Debian is really anti ButterFS. I, no. That, no, what I'm saying is Debian is very, very slow at bringing and upgrading. Debian releases are always a number of kernels behind, a uh, number of fixes behind. There's reasons for it, but Debian is an all-volunteer system. Debian does not have the corporate support like Fedora does or like OpenSUSE does or like Ubuntu has. Ubuntu uses De Debian as a base. Debian is buy-in for sysadmin, so it is very conservative. 
extremely. So literally, you could start the support for them as a volunteer. Do you know if Ubuntu has announced anything about future mm -hmm. Butterfest usage? Uh, no, I am not aware of that. Um, I, I Dick? seem to be looking now at Ubuntu's uh, software center with uh, support for ButterFS, but with conversion from the XT3. <coughs> okay. Sounds like it's not all the way there yet. Okay. Everyone I know uses it with the XT4. Well, uh, Ubuntu has supported ButterFS. So you, you can convert to ButterFS using Ubuntu. It's part of their system, but it is not their default file system. That's the big difference, is when it becomes the default, so that when you do a clean install, that's what's going to do unless you want to change. Okay, of course, we're Linux, and you can put any file system you want on there because almost every file system ex is supported by Linux, including NT you can actually boot off an NTFS file system. But, but, you but the conversion that they're offering, excuse me, the, the default option to go to PTRFS yeah. comes with a conversion routine from EXT3. That's so okay, 4 will mount That's going to work on 4? 4 will mount is 3. Yep. Just okay. do a clean shutdown. Okay. Do not try to do that after a dirty shutdown. Because yeah. then you'll lose your journal protection. Yeah. But you remember, I hope that flashes out big when, when it runs. Okay. Uh, one of the things, one of the issues with ButterFS that I see that's <coughs> right now is a major sounding board is that the GNU utilities DF and DU just do not work with ButterFS. ButterFS does have their own DF and DU utilities. Uh, but I, in looking at a couple of websites, this comes from the ButterFS team, and I quote, so in general, it is impossible to give an accurate estimate of the amount of free space on any ButterFS file system. Yes, this sucks. If you have a really good, if you have a really good idea for how to make it simple for users to understand how much space they've got left, please do let us know. But also please be aware that the finest minds in the BTRFS development have been thinking about this problem for at least a couple of years, and we haven't found a simple solution yet. I have, I have, it's in my references, you can go to the um, several places where to find that, but it's... Uh, so something in the nature of a file system makes it difficult, if not impossible, to figure out actual space usage? Compression. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. So it makes it... A part of the issue is that you can... Uh, change RAID levels on a per, a per file or per directory basis. Yes. So it's not one, like one single uh, reference for the yeah. entire file system. It works a little bit differently than other file systems. Um, so it's something that they're working on, as is obvious. <clears throat> and it happens to be a big issue to some people. <clears throat> it's just if you allocate a file system that's going to be you know it's going to be big enough, you should have plenty of room now. The problem is, another thing with ButterFS, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that in a file system, there is a section of that file system that is reserved for data, and a section of that file system that is reserved for metadata. So that's I get part of the issue, you can run out of space in the metadata. Okay. Uh, and more stuff on the file system full. Uh, if you read Mark Merlin's blog, uh, index number 12, I found a lot of good data there and preventing a BTRFS nightmare. 
comes from the Linux something or other journal, um, and that is my number 12 thing, That's, which is wrong. I think that should have been 13. So. Okay, ZFS. I'm calling ZFS a commercial file system. ZFS is owned and licensed by Sun, or by Oracle rather, that bought Sun. It was developed by Sun. It is a tree-based system. They use a B-plus tree, I believe. No, or an H tree, I don't remember. Designed to focus on data integrity, uses storage pools for allocation. Max volume is 256 zebibytes, which I can't think of. And the max file, <laughs> yeah. the max file is 16 exabytes. But those are things that Oracle thinks of. And uh, there's two to the 48 max files. ZFS is a favorite file system for some NAS implementations. It is mature and it's optimized for data integrity. Um, and again, I would right now today recommend ZFS if I were running, for, running a NAS in a Linux-based NAS or a BSD-based NAS. It's a good file system. I think one of the problems with ZFS I didn't want to get into here is that ZFS is licensed by Oracle, and Oracle could, are you saying no? You said that word. Sorry. What? You said that word, Oracle. Oh, oh. Like and license. Okay, that's, I'm Jewish, I don't understand this. <laughs> uh, in any case, the um, it's an X. Yeah, the, <laughs> I know what you're doing. I'm just giving you some shit. Okay, the problem is in the Linux community is that ZFS is even though it's been contributed to Linux, uh, it is really maintained by Oracle. And Oracle is, Oracle could with, withdraw support if they wanted to. Uh, but they're, on the other side of that is that in the Linux community and in the BSD communities, there is a lot of issues around licensing. ButterFS is GPL. There's no licensing issues. But ZFS is a commercial license, so. That's okay. Can I make a comment on this? Yes. So basically, once when Sun was sold to Oracle, the people that developed all of ZFS and Solaris kind of split off. So there is something called Open ZFS, and they yes. have, there's two different. It's even worse than that, right? There's two mm -hmm. different ZFSs. There's the Sun-supported ZFS, which has things like encryption, and then there's the open version, where all the smart people who actually developed and went and worked on it, they have a whole bunch of different features that are actually arguably better, and they're now not certain to be compatible. So if you use the open ZFS, which most of us who do, like the FreeBSD and all that stuff is based on that, you actually get better features. There's, a, there's this cloud of whether Oracle can sue you. And then there's also Solaris 11 commercial ZFS, and that's slightly different, and it diverged like three years ago, right? Like OpenOffice and... Libre office. It's worse than that though, right? Because it's yeah. not as though open office is, is like run by a company that could sue LibreOffice, yeah. right? Well open office is now Apache. Yeah. So it's not even owned by Oracle. So uh, you know, but it's it's an important thing to realize that again, if Oracle wanted to, they could essentially sue the people of open they could and they, they may or may not win in court but nobody has the money to fight oracle at that level of resources which exactly. is why it's a, a legitimate threat yes so essentially i would you know most of the zfs butterfs battles right now i think on a technical basis i think butterfs is a little bit on the losing side of that right now, but 
when you look at some of these online discussions, but ButterFS is really gaining in support. So, as I said, I'm going to mealy mouth it a little bit, and I said that be it ButterFS, I think, is almost ready for prime time. Um, it said Fedora 23 is going to have it, which is going to be this time frame next year, probably. And I haven't looked at the specific schedules. Uh, it's already in SUSE 13.2 as the default file system, and I would not be surprised to see it in Ubuntu also in the same next year time frame. Uh, it's been used in Ubuntu, and a couple of uh, websites I've been to really were Ubuntu implementations. And the problem with a lot of these websites now is that you've got to look at the time frame of when these disasters happen. Because this, this guy is new, uh, and you've got to look at the operating system and what version that they're actually using. And that's settling down. So ButterFS is settling down. Some of the early adopters love it, and some have been burned. Okay. So I, I do have a lot of uh, links. And again, Mark Merlin is number 10. He has a number of, uh, just number of reasons why you should consider using ButterFS. Real copy and write snapshots and file level incremental server OS upgrades. Okay. Riser FS. And this is where I skipped FS and I just totally missed putting XFS in here. I meant to have it, I just forgot about it. And I didn't realize this, oh, I forgot XFS while I was driving in. And so I'm not going to take out the computer and add it in while I'm driving. Riser FS is a B-tree based file system with journaling. It was a default in SUSE Linux systems until October 2006 when SUSE adopted EXT3. Um, it was developed by a company called Namesys, which was really Hans Riser's company. And Hans Riser was accused and convicted of killing his wife. And essentially, the uh, development on Riser FS kind of stopped and slowed down. It is still, uh, there is some maintenance in that area. You can still probably get Riser FS if you wanted it. Uh, but I don't see any reason for it. But, uh, some of the people that were involved in Riser S, including uh, Chris Mason, actually came from that development team. So you got that. Um, Another thing I'm not going to talk about a little bit is trees. Um, I've done a lot of work in my background actually on trees with B trees, B plus trees, binary trees, balance trees and stuff like that. I've got a lot of experience in that in my work, but I'm not really going to talk about that here. That's not it. But I do have in my references, I have a lot of references to things like that. Uh, Riser FS directory contents or B plus tree. File allocation is a bitmap. Max volume is 16 terabytes. And the max file size is one exabyte. And max file size is 2 to 34. And supports efficient small file allocation. Yeah, it doesn't look good. What? Basically, you're saying that the, uh, the uh, maximum size for an image or file is like several million times larger than the maximum size for a mouse. I've got to go back and look at that. That might be a typo. But in any case, yeah, an exabyte is a lot bigger than 16 terabytes. So, um, where I got this information from is in my links back, and here's the references. I did a little, a lot of research on stuff, so I didn't want to do a lot of this stuff from the top of my head. So I did 
I pulled out a lot of references. And you'll see there are a couple of Wikipedias in there because I do want to, looking for references, a lot of times I'll start at Wikipedia and look at who they're referencing going back to some of these documents. Um, I always use Wikipedia with a grain of salt because it doesn't necessarily have to be correct. Okay, um, the blue background is bad for this, so let me see if I can, I can't change that. Uh, you can download the slides, but you'll see I've got uh, a whole bunch of uh, links. And so you can download the slides and actually the links are clickable so you can actually get them from there. Cool. Okay, and that's about all I have. Any questions? Any questions or anyone? I hope this doesn't seem like too dumb a question. There are no dumb yeah. questions. Since you were talking about the compression of RFS, suppose I suppose I adopt it and then I copy a file over to a, a USB stick with fat something or other or mm -hmm. one of the other file systems. Am I gonna find that I can't read that on there? No. So when you copy a file from one file system to another. Now remember Linux also supports NTFS and FAT. So if you're going to copy a file from a ButterFS file system or a ZFS file system to a FAT32 or FAT16 or NTFS, you're copying the file and the file contents. It'll be uncompressed and you'll get the uncompressed version of the file. So it's part of the file system, and again, uh, EXT actually has some automatic compression that you can add into it. Yes, Jill? Um, early on, you, you said that it was an advantage that Linux buffers files rather than writing them out immediately. Yes. That's a speed advantage, but what happens if you lose power? Are you going to lose your file? Um, or have an old version of it? This is where the metadata comes in. Uh, generally, that's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, uh, I've, I've been burned by that in the past in old, in the old Unix systems. Things happen all the time. And then your FS check would run for hours, and then you found you lost the file. But for the most part, you're not going to lose a lot of money. First of all, first of all, your files are not kept in buffers forever. There is a flush. There is a flush demon that runs in Linux that will cause all buffers to be flushed to disk. Now that is part of the file system, and there are some configurable options for it. And ButterFX actually has some additional options on that. Yes, Dave. Um, now I'll get to you. Yeah, sure. but going back to that first question, but pushing harder, um, let's say we have one EXT4 mm -hmm. file system computer. Yes. Local networks to run ButterFS computer. Yep. And instead of copying files over, I just want to work with a remote file, either direction. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, do a mail operation, something of that sort. Mm -hmm. Push, pushing a little harder on the question. Are they bulletproof on that sort of remote interaction? That's, that's one of the standard basic things that you're doing. And it's actually going to take the file from one area and read it in memory and whatever it does with it. Because when you read it from memory, for instance, when you read a document, whether the document is a docx or the document is an ODT or something like that, it's read into the memory and it's in that format. So basically all those manipulations of the remote file will be done in local memory? Um, 
generally, yeah. Uh, generally is what I'm worried about. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I want to know, is there an example where I'm going to get stuck before I get there? That's what I'm asking. Well, let me, let me post an example. Let's talk about a cloud. Let's say that you have a cloud that is some weird file system nobody's ever heard of. Okay? Yeah. Or maybe it's an IBM mainframe somewhere. Because IBM invented cloud, really. They just didn't call it the cloud back then. Okay. We're so glad when we got away from it. Um, essentially, you're operating on your computer, which is a Linux computer. You're operating on the cloud, which is run somewhere and you have no idea. Anything whatsoever. You don't know about it, you don't maintain it, you don't know what file system it is. It's irrelevant what file system it has. So the file system should support what you are doing. So you should really care what the file system is. You can copy files from your local laptop, which might be running XT2, and you can copy files to a ButterFS file system, uh, or another thing would be NFS. Is if your mount, if your NFS mounting a ButterFS file system on your local file system, it doesn't matter. It's NFS. Well, I understand that's the target. I'm yep. wondering about. ButterFS not quite being ready for prime time. I mean, I, is it generally solid on these limits? Yes. Good. Thanks. I would say 100%. Okay, we have a question here waiting to be answered. Uh, and two more. <laughs> Encryption. Yes. Is that done in any of these file systems or is that at a different layer of the operating system? Uh, if I didn't look so much in encryption, it is usually a different layer, but I believe there is direct support for encryption both in the XT4 and ButterFS. I would go read source, but Linux generally uses Lux encryption, and I don't think that's a problem. So it has nothing to do with how the files are laid out. Encryption files are files on the file system anyway. And everything on disk is going to be encrypted. Uh, let's see. Go ahead. I, was, I was wondering about licensing for um, GFS. Do you know what the status is? For the I didn't look at GFS. Um, GFS is uh, the Gluster file system. Uh, it used to be yeah. Red Hat, Enterprise yeah. Linux, Advanced Platform. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, essentially GFS is a uh, clustering file system. Um, clustering is a little bit beyond the scope here. Uh, I didn't look mm -hmm. at it, um, although the XT4 actually started as part of that. Uh, and the, the and a lot of these file systems are have, have a lot of uh, experience with the cluster systems. But I can't talk specifically about where the cluster file systems are right now, GFS and things like that. <coughs> and that was also an Oracle thing for a while. So it was multi-company. Um, so you said you don't want to talk about B trees and trees in general, um, but every time I look up for ButterFS, the first feature I see is oh, it's B tree. Wow. Um, okay. What, what is just the basics of B tree? What does it change compared to a non B tree system? <coughs> you have an entire version of mathematics going on here, but I'll see if I can explain it here, and what I want to do is shut down the room here. Okay. Um, there are a 
number of tree, number of different tree type. Um, and one of the references in there does point you to trees. There's a discussion of trees. But essentially, you have a binary tree. So you start at the top here, on the root of the tree. Okay? And off of each node, you have zero, one, or two children. And each node has zero, one, or two children. And I've done a lot with binary trees, balancing trees, and stuff like that. Uh, a B tree. And IBM actually used a B tree structure with vSAN back in the um, VSAM back in uh, the 1970s. A uh, B tree, I'm a little bit rusty on the actual implementation of the B tree, but you have a node and you can have a number of sub nodes of the BT, but it's, it's kind of a combination of an entry tree and a binary tree. And I forget the actual details of it because I didn't really look that up again. You know I've worked, I've actually worked with B-trees before. I just have forgotten the exact implementation of them. But a B-tree is an entry tree that is a self-balancing tree. And the real difference here is that a binary tree can be totally out of balance. So a binary tree can essentially be nothing more than a link list, which is nothing. So in a, the optimal tree for binary tree is to go down the tree and make the root of the tree the middle of the tree. Trees like B tree have automatic um, ways of keeping the subtree in balance. And IBM back in the 70s had a system called ISAM, Index Sequential Access Method. And every once in a while, the ISAM administrators had to shut the stupid thing down, totally unload it, and then reload it from scratch. And it was one of the things that the ISAM guys had to do almost all the time. VSAM used a B tree and it was always adjusting itself. So a VSAM database essentially did not require as much maintenance like that as the ISAM did, although it did require some. And essentially the B tree provides uh, quite a bit of efficiency. And that's why all the new file systems are B tree based or B plus tree or whatever. Uh, there's also an H tree and I didn't look that up. I've never heard of it before. But uh, I worked with a company years ago called Higher Order Software and their product used an entry tree. They did not use a B tree structure. They did not use a, um, they used their own tree, but it was an entry tree. Every node had multiple children, and each child had a sibling. So is ext4 b3 as well? No. I just looked at it. I think it looks like a b3. You know, it is? Yeah, yeah. Most yeah, it has, ext4 does have b3 structures in it, but the basic system like I know the block, I think it's it still says the there. link list plus like hash B, B, B tree. Okay, That's so it's a hash B tree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a hash, does everybody know what a hash is? Other than something to eat. <laughs> oh, I'm already hungry, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. Give me something to catch, please. Okay, what a hash is, is you take a phrase or a word or a number and what you do is you put it through an algorithm 
to create, let's say, a shorter number. Let's say that you have a, you want to store something in a list or an array, and you only have so many slots in an array, but you have a lot more things that are going to possibly, you need to fit things in the array, but when, when you want to put something in the array, uh, what you want to do is you want to hash that number. Let's say social security number. You hash the social security number so it fits in this array slot. And then there's always algorithms to where if that array slot is actually has something in it, that's what's called a collision, and you handle the collision. But uh, what a hash is, is you, you're essentially taking a number, or taking a word or a phrase, and essentially hashing it into a smaller number using uh, some random function. And there are a lot of hashing algorithms around in computer science. Some are good, some don't work. So, two quick questions. One was, could you just talk a little bit about XFS and how it compares sort of in the, in the framework of what you talked about and then... Okay. XFS is, as I said, it's a journaling file system that was uh, written by um, Silicon Graphics. Uh, essentially, it is a tree-based system again. Uh, it's out there. Um, but what makes it good for giant? I, mean, I only hear about it in terms of giant file systems where, like, EXT is not as why is EXT it, not as it good? essentially. It efficiently supports a much, much larger number of nodes than these other file systems. Um, remember, XFS and ZFS and JFS were developed by large companies enterprise data. for enterprise data. And essentially, I don't know what the hell they use on Watson, even though. Uh, a part of, a likely part of that group. But, um, and then, the XFS is now the default for Red Hat. Right? So, yeah. so large or small, they have to be. The file system limit is 18 XYs. It's okay. only slightly bigger than it's in the yeah. But, XFS, over the years and discussions of file systems, when we get online and discuss list and stuff like that. Uh, I've always heard people like XFS. It's been a decent file system. Uh, I don't know what the licensing is for Linux. Um, I would probably think that by Red Hat putting it in to Enterprise Linux, that they specifically got licensing directly from SGI. It must be because it's in it's in all the derivatives as well, like yeah. scientific and CentOS. Yeah. Oh, it would be, yeah. Yeah. And then, do you actually see? I mean, what are the advantages of Butter to an end user, right? Because it's doing all this other. I mean, I I know this from the ZFS side, right? And it's always going to be slower than like an EXT4 because it's doing so much more stuff, right? Why would you want? ButterFS on a small laptop or something. It seems like overkill. ButterFS will probably be faster on your small laptop. Okay. But then EXT. Well, one of the reasons, EXT is very rapidly, <coughs> it, it's like IPv4. It's very rapidly being outgrown. We're getting into some of these large file systems. Um, you know, when I first started in computers, kilobytes was a lot of stuff, okay? Um, I worked on a point of sale system that actually had 4K words of data. It was a PDP-8, so it was a 12-bit work. Um, so, and some of the structures in EXT have to be redone, but you know it's possible that 
you know, ext4 could be the file system in the future. I think more of the fact that Ted thinks that ButterFS is a better file system. And I, I don't know. I did not see that in writing. I've only heard it second, second class. But if you think that's the future, it's the future because there's not going to be any XT5. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you can't say that because it can happen. You never know. Um, well, somebody else could fork it, but if he starts supporting that one, he's a good quality support. Exactly. I think the thing is, when you're dealing with laptop today, you're dealing with essentially things like a uh, couple hundred gigabytes of data. But remember now that you're also dealing with clouds. Uh, the new Fedora actually has um, a couple of different spins. There's uh, the workstation Fedora 21, there's the cloud-based Fedora 21, and there's a server-based Fedora 21. I just want to mention that for most of you, all versions of Linux contain the ability to be a server. Unlike Windows, is you can't do server things on Windows 7. Or you can't do workstation things well on a Windows server. And it's more of, in a server, how the release is configured out of the box. So you can take a Red Hat Enterprise, put that on your desktop, but you're not going to get all the bells and whistles you will in Fedora because the repositories are not going to support that. Uh, but you can get Red Hat Enterprise Linux Workstation and you'll have some of those. And so it's just that the on the enterprise versions, you're not going to have a lot of the bells and whistles and nice, nice things that you're going to want on your laptop, stuff like that. But I think as a file system... That's just on the install media. Yeah. Uh, I think we use the same repo, so you can still yeah. install it back to this uh, yeah. network. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, yeah, you can install a lot of things on Linux that are not there, but you can have a... You can take a desktop, uh, an Ubuntu desktop system and make it into a server if you want to. Um, it's just not originally configured as a server. And that's one of the advantages, I think, of Linux. But in terms of what file system you want, as the end user, you want a file system that is reliable. And you also want a file system that doesn't waste a lot of space. And I think that uh, ButterFS actually addresses, like for RiserFS, it addresses a lot of the wastage that you had with uh, small files. Um, now, if you had to store photos and stuff like that, that's, you know, those are relatively large files, so it, it doesn't really matter. But uh, the compression helps a little bit. So if you have uh, 160 gigs of hard disk space, with a ButterFS, you might end up with more usable space. Except so the only problem there is you can't figure out how much free space you have. Because it doesn't know. It would actually, to go in there and do that, it would actually, actually decompress a lot of these things. Where you just turn off compression altogether. Or at least you have to understand what, like, do you, like, will give you, like on ZFS, with deduplication and compression, it will give you a number, but you have to understand that that number isn't what you are used to seeing when it yes. tells you how many, but it still is quite useful if it tells you, you know, mm -hmm. how much space it's ostensibly taking up, but it's, it's not terribly well documented. Yeah. The other, the other thing that uh, they're really working on in ButterFS, and they've made tremendous improvement, is in the tools and utilities. Uh, right now, the FS check is offline, but they are working on an online file system check. Um, and things like that. Of course, 
there's the dynamic defragmentation, I think. that I have never seen a Linux system that has been heavily fragmented, except when you start getting into a file system full situation on Linux, that's when you've got to get into the uh, fragmentation issues. Uh, but if you clear that out, file system like ext4 and uh, butterfs will kind of dynamically defragment for you. You won't see it. Whereas Windows, you always have to run a fragmenter if you want to be defragmented. So. <clears throat> but there is actually a defragmentation utility that comes with uh, ButterFS. And I think XT4 has one too. But for the most part, you know, there was never, there's never been a GNU defragmentation utility. That would be pretty hard to port, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine having to port that to mm -hmm. all the different operating systems or file systems that it's on top of? It? Yeah. Well, a lot of those things are really defragment or let's say I want to defrag the file system, so you have a GNU defragger, and that would actually be linked to the file system specific version. If one existed, right? If one existed. So. You also didn't talk about like FAT, FAT32, XFAT, right? Which is actually yeah. relevant for like embedded, a lot of, if you like run Linux off an SD card, it's probably yeah. formatted with FAT, right? Yeah, I didn't mention that. FAT30, you can boot, you can boot off of FAT32, you can boot off of uh, NTFS, but they're not native I file systems. Um, you don't really want to because in Linux and Unix, you have the permission schemes. Essentially, you have the concept of owner, group, and everybody else. And, and you've got the other three flags, like the sticky bit and stuff like that. Um, Windows file systems like FAT32 and NTFS don't have the same concept. They have their own flags, which are different. So, when you're reading, if you're if you have, if you have an NTFS-based Linux system, you don't really have the file permissions that are set up properly. But even those systems where you can boot off a USB, it's really just the boot directory that's the uh, the FAT system. Yeah. And yeah. After it loads, yeah, yeah, and no, that's, that's true. Yeah. I mean, sometimes there are reasons that you want it. Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't talk that's about fair. it because they're, no, no, that's fair. That's they're fair. not Linux native file that's systems. That's fair. Um, I certainly could have. Uh, back in the day, I've had to go in and restore a FAT16 <sighs> system oh, God. years and years ago. Not fun. That I, have, I didn't ever have a, I did for a short period of time had a Windows system. But I used to run an Atari system which had the Windows file system. So. Then Bill Clinton got elected president, and that was the end of Windows for you, right? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that's basically what things you've got to have a file system, and as the end user, you just want the file system to work. And when it doesn't work, you're going to blame the operating system. And so you need the file system to be able to support all the things you're going to do as an end user. So you're going to have large files, you're going to have small files, stuff like that. And also you're going to have SSDs. You know, and SSDs are coming down in price. They're good SSD drives and they're sucky ones. But um, if your file system doesn't properly um, support it, the life of that SSD is going to be shortened. And what is that? So let's say this. Okay. Al, can you repeat what you? I mean, that's what that was. And you said solid state disk. I think I actually have one. Yes. Yeah. Had you ever said that? 
Yeah, SSD file systems, solid state file systems are like flash memory except for an entire disk. Um, so it makes, if you've got to put it in a laptop, it makes that laptop a lot lighter. Uh, and it's also faster than a spinning drive. <coughs> and more bounce proof. Yeah. yeah, except I used to know a guy that would take disk drives and drop them on a concrete floor and they'd still continue running. Yes, yeah, so if you drop them flat where well, they're he, not spinning. He made them, he made them for, he, he built them and yeah. it was cheap. Cheap, cheap user grade laptop ones do not like being dropped at an angle on the floor. Particularly when spinning. Exactly. That's don't want to do it. But SSDs are so I, I got my wife an early laptop SSD because she kept forgetting to close the laptop before now. <coughs> Unfortunately, this was one of the ones that was so early that uh, it had its own issues with the uh, drivers. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that really uh, the bottom line here is that EXT4 is starting, or EXT is starting to run out of steam. It's, you know, take it's going to take a lot of maintenance to really move that and support things in the future. And ButterFS essentially has a lot of the stuff that you're going to want. So, as I said, Fedora 23 is going to have ButterFS as the default operating default file system. SUSE 13.2 already has that. Um, Ubuntu has ButterFS available, but it's not the default, and I think by next year it will be. They tend to go the way that they think is, so if their community doesn't like ButterFS, they're not going to go to it. It, it appears to be available yes. in Red Hat Enterprise 7. As yes, it they call it the technology preview, but you can select it at install time Yes, instead of XFS, which is the default. Yes, you can install um, ButterFS in Fedora. It goes back at least to Fedora 18. Because I think I installed it on, when I upgraded to Fedora 19, I installed ButterFS, and I had at that time I had a mirrored system, so I had SD, um, I had SDA, I had SDB as my mirrored drives, and SDC was where I did my backups, and. I made a bit of a mistake. I cleared out SDA, SDA and SDB, um, the RAIDs, I, because I wanted it to be automatically allocated. And I, by mistake, I allowed it to stripe the three of them onto, so it striped not only A and B, but it took the free space on C which is I didn't want it, so I then wiped that out and I just did an EXT4 with RAID, with RAID 1, which is what I'm working with now. But um, I'm going to be upgrading to ButterFS when I get a chance to do it. So on, on RAID, when you did that, you were probably using software RAID. Yes. So is when ButterFS and ZFS, when they're doing RAID for you, is that also automatically software RAID? Generally, yes. Yeah. Uh, you so, really should, it, like, especially with ZFS, they absolutely want you to not use a hardware RAID controller. Not use a hardware RAID uh, Absolutely not. Partly so because it's so-called RAID 5 right hole. Are they incompatible then? No, you, you can do it, right? I mean, because you can expose a hardware RAID as a single volume to ZFS to write on top of, but then you lose half the benefit of ZFS, which is the error checking, the validation, the redundancy, and the counting, and all that stuff. So it's 
you're supposed to basically just, it's basically for JBODs with the, the, just a bunch of disks and it manages. It basically replaces the custom ASIC and array controller with the CPU of your computer, basically mm -hmm. leveraging yeah. the fact that computational power has grown exponentially while storage space, or storage performance has not. Flip side, the other disadvantage of using a hardware rate controller is if the hardware rate controller goes bad, you need to replace it with the exact same part number. That screwed. Yes. I have been so screwed by like bad cables. Like it, like I had one case with a, a RAID controller that was a Dell. Uh, this is why you don't want to buy enterprise hardware off of eBay. But there was <laughs> there was a corruption in the MFTs that the RAID controller overwrote the first beginnings of my whole RAID and it had to go to hardware recovery. Whereas with ZFS, the chance of that happening is negligible, like very very low because it stores all the drive structure metadata in multiple copies across the disk. So the probability that you can't recover it. Like Boston that. Boston user groups a number of years ago bought two Dell servers. It was Pat Torme who was president at the time. And they had hardware RAID and the BLU got one free. And both of those systems cracked. One was running Windows and the RAID controller just died and really trashed the disks. And we have a similar thing on Linux. So I don't think you'll find in this group too many people that like hardware RAID. Johnny, you wait. I'll wait, yeah. And it's not faster anymore. Right? Yeah. I think maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago, the RAID 5 calculations got offloaded to an independent engine that was faster. But now it's they're not faster than Intel, right? Yeah. If you've got six cores sitting around, one of them can do the RAID calculations a lot faster than a custom chip. But the big advantage of the software RAID is, is the fact that you're not going to have a controller failure that's going to screw you. You can take the disks out and try to fix it in another machine. It doesn't have to be the same part number or whatever. Because mm -hmm. we tried that. We just couldn't recover those disks. Oh, and with ZFS. Even like even the incompatibility between the Oracle one and the free one, they all read. Like you can always take a Z pool, a ZFS pool, and read it out. Like you you might not be able to administer it or monitor it, but like the whole thing was based on data integrity. So I think there's not a case where it would be incompatible, with the exception of encryption. If you encrypt it, then all bets are off. Mm -hmm. And this is open VA. I think what well, so it. I mean, the other people may know more than I do, but there's like there's a version number of the ZFS pool. Yeah. And they, up to version, I guess, 28, uh, they, they sort of upgraded this every few months when it was Sun. Um, everything, that's sort of the lingua franca. So anything that's up to Z pool 28, either Oracle or the more recent ones can read. And then the more recent ones, they added all these features, but I think it still should be read compatible for 28. So I think the Oracle one will always be able to read the free one. I'm not, I can't say that the other way around would work. You can't necessarily write to it, but because it's basically one gigantic set of bytes that has all the integrity and the checksums, so at least it knows that what it's reading is consistent or not. So I think you can almost always read a ZFS Z pool no matter where you put it, even if you can't write to it or change it. That's sort of a I think, fundamental design goal. You sound as if you're keen on ZFS. I, I'm a scientist, and so like data integrity matters more than anything else. And um, I think Butter is going to, it's probably going to end up just being used more because of the licensing stuff. But, yeah. I, but, but storage people are so conservative, I think that in the end they're just going to end up coexisting. Like people that have ZFS pool, I don't see, I don't see a lot of people that, if they already set up a giant ZFS installation, I don't really see anything in Butter that's going to be worth the hassle of changing just because people are used to it, right? I, I would totally 100% agree with that. Uh, you know, first of all, I think you're going to find you've got the religious zealots on both sides. You have the religious zealots that are, if it's not open source and it's not fully licensed as open source, they're not going to touch it. And that's the Debian side of it, really. You will never see ZFS as a supported Debian file system because that's the way they are. Don't, don't say never. I mean, I, Evil Prince Larry has spun off some commercial products as 
open source. Mm -hmm. He has agreed to. Um, but essentially, you know, essentially, there are people I've been you know, reading, and what I wanted to do in there was I wanted to look at really things, at reasons why not to use ButterFS. And there were a few things, and I've got them in my references. But ButterFS is better than it was last year. It's right now good. Um, if it's good enough, SUSE has always been the release that engineers tend to like and prefer. When I was at DEC and Compaq and HP, SUSE was our preferred version of uh, Linux. But you say it's in open SUSE. What's the situation with the enterprise SUSE? You know, I don't know. I haven't looked at that. It's they have really not. They they were European in their enterprise, so I really don't know who does it. But the real king of enterprise Linux is uh, Red Hat. I mean, I would also say that, I mean, I think ZFS is mature today, and the yes. types of tweaks that they make on it are really, they're really good and they're really refined. And it's also, I think, a specific enough thing that it's going to keep getting developed because yep. the people the people are, are real geeks. I mean, they're my kind of folks, right? And they really like, I mean, like, the, the, the feature flags, the new features they're implementing are stuff like to make erasing things much faster. And they, they go through and they really have beat on this code. The code has been really... And if you care about enterprise, Oracle will sell you Enterprise. Your choice, Linux or Solaris, they'll support it with Enterprise support. And if you have get an academic license price, it doesn't even hurt. Well, mine's all, I mean, I'm running the sort of Illumos, the forked open Solaris thing, so I don't run BSD on my NAS box, but they've, the features here, I mean, it's mature. I think Butter's going to take